Good morning, everybody. This is Professor Moser. I'm going to record the video lecture for today. This is going to be on sections 2.4 and 2.5. But before doing so, where we left off was in section 2.3. In particular, we're on the notes portion that deals with fractions and decimals. Any fraction can be written in decimal form, but the opposite is not true for many decimal numbers. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more, highlight that in the, in the next section. But for the ones that can be, let's take a look at the, the place value chart. We already talked about the whole number positions from before. If you have a whole number, it starts with the ones, then tens, then hundreds, then thousands, etc., and goes on to the left. If we have a number that's a fraction or doesn't have a exact whole part to it, then we can write it as a decimal. The decimal point comes immediately after the ones position. And then from there, the positions are the tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousands, hundred thousands, and millions. So that same pattern we talked about, base unit, hundreds of that unit, and then thousands of that unit still persists. But just kind of be aware that one of the little things that's a little bit different is there is no equivalent like once unit, whereas it goes ones and then tens and then hundreds. The decimals start out at tenths and then hundredths. One of the first skills we want to develop is the ability to turn a fraction into a decimal, and this can be done using lo classic long division. So the fraction 5 eighths really means take 8 and divide it into 5. Well, we know that 8 can't go into 5 evenly. It's more than 5. So what we do is we write the decimal point, so the decimal point would naturally occur behind the 5. So 8 cannot go into 5 because it's too, too big. But if we add the decimal point and then add a zero, it is possible to take eight into 50, okay? Eight goes into 50, not four times. How about six times? So eight times six is 48. We subtract, 50 minus 48 would give us a two. We can add a zero and bring the next zero down and continue this process. 8 will now go into the number 20 twice. 8 times 2 is 16. We subtract, we get 4, add a 0, bring a 0 down. 8 goes into 40 five times. 8 times 5 is 40. And notice that we now get 0 remainder. So we would say that this decimal terminates or, or stops. So 5 eighths as a decimal would be equivalent to 0 0.6 to five. If you wanted to, to say this decimal in terms of words, it's tenths, hundredths, thousandths. So the last number is in the thousandths position. So this number would be read as 625 thousandths. We can do another example. If we wanted to take seven over 20 and convert it to a decimal, we're going to take 20 and divide it into 7. We know that 20 cannot go into 7 because it's too big. So I'm going to go ahead and add a 0. When we think of the number 7, it's a whole number, so there's no decimal point that inherently comes with it. So you can put it right behind the last uh, ones position. We can now add a 0. We would know that 20 can go into 73 times. 3 times 20 is 60. We then subtract, this will give us a one and a zero. We can add another zero to bring it down. 20 will go into 100 five times. And then five times 20 is 100. We subtract and it leaves a zero remainder. So we see that 7 20ths would be equivalent to the decimal 35 hundredths or 0.35. Okay. These kinds of decimals that we just saw in example 11 and 12 are what's referred to as terminating decimals. And that's because their decimal expansion stops at some specific place value. Okay. The next example is gonna be an example of what's gonna be referred to ultimately as a repeating decimal. So let's again take 5 sixths and write it as a decimal. To do so, we know that this is gonna involve long division. So I'm gonna take six into five. Well, 6 cannot go into 5 evenly, so I put a 0 up top. I can add a 0, and now 6 will go into 50. 
six will go into into 50 eight times. Eight times six we know is 48. We subtract 50 minus 48 would give us a two. We can add a zero and bring that zero down. Six will go into 20 three times. Three times six is 18. We subtract, that will give us a two. We can add a zero, bring another zero down. Six will go into 20 three times again. That's gonna be 18. Subtract, we get a two, add a zero and bring another zero down. And what we quickly realize is that this, we're kind of in a loop here. This process is just gonna continue generating a bunch more threes. So we will be stuck and we will kind of be doing this forever where the decimal is gonna be 8.333 forever, okay? This is why we call it a repeating decimal. And the way that we're typically gonna write this is you put down the, the 0.8 and then whatever sequence of numbers is getting repeated, you put a bar over top of it. So here it's the threes that are getting repeated. So you put the first three down in that pattern and you put a bar over top of it. And that would be equivalent to 0.833333 which is our first example of a repeating decimal. The next procedure we're gonna look at is for writing a terminating decimal as a fraction. So we've gone from fraction to decimals via long division. Now we're gonna look at the process of going backwards from decimal to fraction. The way that we do this is we drop the decimal point and we place the resulting number in the numerator of a fraction. So you just throw away the decimal point and whatever your decimal value was, your decimal number, you're gonna put it in the numerator of a fraction. For the denominator, we're gonna use the power of 10 that is the furthest to the right decimal point. So wherever the last place in the decimal value of your number is, if it's in the tenth position, then we're going to put the denominator over 10. If the decimal goes out to the hundredths position, then we're going to put that number over 100. Similarly, if it goes out to the thousandths position, then we're going to put that number over 1,000. That gives us our fraction, and then the very last step would be to reduce it if possible. Let's look at a few examples of this. In example 14, we want to write each decimal as a fraction. So in example A, we see that it's 0.8 which is eight tenths. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just take the decimal point, throw it away, let's call it eight, and then because the last decimal portion of it, that eight lies in the tenths position, so we simply put it over 10. So 0.8 is equivalent to eight over 10. However, we're not done yet because we know we have to reduce this. So eight, eight tenths can be simplified. The GCF of eight and 10 is two. So we're gonna divide top and bottom of our fraction by two, and that would give us four fifths. So that's our equivalent fraction, and it is in simplest terms. So we would say that 0.8 as a fraction would be four fifths. <clears throat> Let's do the same thing for the next number. If we have 0.65, we wanna go ahead and convert this to a fraction. So we throw away the decimal point, and what we're left with is the number 65. We are gonna put that number 65 on top of 100, because if you look at the last piece of the decimal value, the furthest position is the five, which is in the hundreds position. So we're gonna put this entire number over 100. So 65 hundredths means 65 over 100. And once again, this is a situation where we can reduce this. The GCF, of 65 and 100 is gonna be five. We can take five into both of those. Five will go into 65 13 times, and five will go into 120 times. So the decimal 0.65 is equivalent to 30 over 20. Let's take a look at the next one. So again, step one, throw away the decimal point. That's gonna be 24 on top of, this time the last digit is the four, and that's in the tenths, hundredths, thousandths position. 
So that 24 goes on top of 1,000. From here, we want to try to, to reduce this. This one actually will reduce. You can do it as we discussed in class. You can try to find any common factor and to try to break it down from there. If you're looking for the GCF, the GCF of this one is actually going to be 8. So it turns out that the largest number that can go both into 24 and 1,000 is going to be 8. 24 divided by 8 gives us 3. 1,000 divided by 8 would be 125. So 0 0.024 is equivalent to 3 over 125. The last one we have is 2.65. The process works exactly the same way. You throw away the decimal. So that's going to give us the number 265. And it's the location of the last decimal digit that's going to tell us what to put this on top of. So this time we have the 5, which is in the hundreds position, which means that this entire thing is going to go on top of 100. From here, we want to try to go ahead and, and reduce this. Both of these should be divisible by, by 5. So we can divide top and bottom by, by 5. 5 goes into 100. We know that's going to be 20 times. And 5 is going to go into 265. I believe 51. 5 goes into 26 five times. That's 1 and 5. And then 5 goes into 15. It's going to be 53. So we get 53 over 20. That would be as simplified as it gets. 53 is actually a prime number. So the only divisors of 53 are 1 and 53. And none of those divide 20. Notice, by the way, if you're looking at the size of the number, 2.65, that's a whole number. So that's a number that's, that's bigger than 1. Coincidentally, when you look at the fraction that we get, it actually been, ends up being an improper fraction because the numerator is greater than the denominator. So that makes sense because this should be a fraction whose value is, is more than 1 as well. The next one we're going to come to is how do we change a repeating number to a fraction? And there's a, a technique for this. So to change 0.8 repeating, let me go ahead and do this. I'm going to call this x equals our repeating value. So this is going to be what? 0 0.8 repeating. Notice that the repeating portion of it begins in the tenths position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this expression and I'm going to multiply it by 10. So if I call it x, it's going to be 10x. Again, the factor of 10 is coming from the fact that this is in the tenths position. On the right-hand side, you may recall, but multiplying by a power of 10 shifts the decimal point. This is going to shift the decimal point one place to the right. And so instead of having 0 0.8888, 8, 8, 8, when you multiply it by 10, that's going to give us 8.8 .8 repeating. And now the technique is this. We're going to take our 10x, which is equal to 8.8 .8 repeating, and we're going to subtract our 1x, which is just 0 0.8 repeating. We'll focus more on this in the next sections, but if you have 10 of something and you take away one of that thing, that leaves us with nine of those things. So 10x take away 1x will be 9x. On the right-hand side, you can kind of see why we multiplied by 10 now. Whenever you subtract with decimals, you subtract position by position. If we subtract the 1's position, 8 minus 0 is 8. And now look at what's going to happen after the decimal point. We have 0.8 repeating, which is a bunch of 8's, and 0.8 repeating, which is the same bunch of 8's in the same positions. So those will end up canceling each other off, and the decimal portion cancels. So this results in the equation 9x equals to 8. To get the x by itself, 
all we're going to do is divide both sides by 9, and we get the following. This is going to be 8 over 9. If you're not sure about it, you can certainly check this in your calculator. If I look at the fraction 8 over 9, and I punch it in, it had better be the same as our decimal we started with, which is 0.8 repeating. Sure enough, that's exactly what we get, 0.8888. Notice that the calculator has to stop somewhere, so they rounded this last digit, but this should be all 8s, 0.8 repeating. So we did do it correctly. Let's take a look at the next one. Here we want to change 0.63 to a fraction. If it's a repeating decimal, you do the same thing. Let's let x equal the 0 0.63 repeating. This time, the last digit that repeats is in the hundredth position. Because that's in the hundredth position, we're going to need to take our x and multiply it by 100. That will take this 0.63 repeating. Notice how the bar, by the way, it's over top of both the 6 and the 3. Because it's over top of both the 6 and the 3, that means that it's the, that sequence of digits that repeats. So this number is 0 0.63, 0 0.63, 63, 63 forever. Okay. If we multiply it by 100, there's two zeros in 100. So that's going to move the decimal spot two places to the right. And what we get is going to be 63 point and then a bunch of 63s repeating. So I can write that as 63.63 bar. And now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take our bigger value, which is the 100x, which is equal to 63.63 bar. And we're going to subtract the 1x, which is equal to just 0 0.63 repeating. 100x minus x should give us 99x equals, over here, 63 minus 0 is 63. And the repeating parts of this would actually cancel. So the 63 as the decimal part will cancel with this 63 decimal part. And so we get this. So our original value, which we call it x, 99 times it equals to 63. To get the x by itself, we divide both sides by, by 99, and we get this expression. x equals 63 over 99. This is absolutely correct, but it can be reduced. In particular, this can be reduced. Let me be consistent here because both of those numbers are divisible by nine. So nine is the GCF for both 63 and 99. Nine goes into 63 seven times, and nine goes into 99 11 times. So our final answer should be seven over 11. Again, one of the things that's nice with math at this level is the majority of the questions we have a way of checking. Our original decimal we said was 0.63 repeating. If I plug 7 divided by 11 into my calculator, I had better get that 0.63 repeating. And again, sure enough, we do. Don't mind the calculator rounding that last position. But that's 0.6363 forever. So we did it correctly. In the next section, this is section 2.4, which is on the irrational numbers. So we see that a number is irrational if it can be written as a decimal that neither stops nor repeats itself. Okay. So if we go back to these examples that we just did, these are all examples of what we're going to call rational numbers. So a number is rational if its decimal expansion either does stop or 
if it doesn't stop, if it as long as it repeats itself, that will make it rational. So all of these ones we just saw here, these are examples of rational numbers because notice that they all have decimal expansions that stop somewhere. These two, in example 15 and 16, the 0.8 repeating and 0.63 repeating, because those are repeating decimals, those ones will also be rational numbers. To have an irrational number is going to be one whose decimal expansion never stops nor never repeats itself. A classic example of an irrational number, and probably one of our most popular ones, is pi. Pi, you might recall from geometry, is this number 3.1415, blah, blah, blah. It has a decimal expansion that never stops, nor does its pattern ever repeat, so there's no repetition. And so because of that, pi is an example of an irrational number. Another great source of irrational numbers and we're going to talk about these coming up next, are square roots that do not break down entirely. So you might recall that we say that the square root of 16 is equal to 4 because if you take two powers of 4 and multiply them together, that would give us 16. 4 uses a factor twice, gives us 16. And another way to write this would be that the square root of 16 equals to 4. However, there is no natural number that you can multiply by itself twice to get 2. There is an irrational number, which is equal to 1.41 blah blah blah. It, again, has an expansion that never stops and never repeats itself. So the square root of 2 would be another example of an irrational number. Okay. Be very careful. Just because you have a square root does not automatically make it irrational. For instance, if you look at the square root of 16, that reduces to, to 4, which you can think of as like 4.0. So it does stop. So the square root of 16 is rational. The square root of 2, which is not breakdown, would be an example of an irrational number. Okay. So this brings us to a, a more of a discussion of square roots, which we write like this. So if we have the square root of a number, this symbol here, is what's referred to as the, the square root sign. It's also a, a radical. The thing that's on the inside of the radical sign is referred to as the radicand. So in this case, if I write the square root of A, you can see the square root symbol, which is this object here, and the thing that's underneath of that is referred to as the radicand. There are a couple rules that square roots follow. For example, if we have the square root of the product of two numbers, this is equal to the product of their individual square roots. And we can use this oftentimes to simplify some square roots. Whenever you're trying to simplify square roots, before we even get into that, it's really helpful to know the list of the first few square numbers. Okay, So let me kind of write those out. So the ones that you're really primarily responsible for should be those that are on your, like, your standard 12 times tables. One is kind of boring. We all know what 1 squared is. But 2 squared would be 4. 3 squared would be 9. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. 6 squared is 36. 7 squared is 49. 8 squared is 64. 9 squared is 81. 10 squared is 100, 11 squared is 121, and I'm going to try and squeeze it in here, but 12 squared would be 144. 13 squared, again, this is usually not in the standard times tables from school, but 13 squared would actually be 169. Okay. So whenever you're thinking about trying to reduce square roots, these are the numbers you want to look for. The 4, 9, 16, 25, 36. Because those are perfect squared numbers, those are the values that we can exactly take a square root of. So let's take a look at example one. We are asked to simplify the square root of 40. 40 is not a perfect square, but it is divisible by the perfect square 4. So the reason why I'm choosing 4 in particular is because 4 we know is a perfect square. 4 times 10 gives us 40, so we can write 40 as 4 times 10, 
And from what we just said a moment ago, we're allowed to split this apart. We can write this according to properties of radicals as the square root of 4 times the square root of 10. This piece we chose specifically because we know we can reduce that. The square root of 4 is going to be 2. And then the way that we'll write this piece is we'll just leave it as 2 square root of 10. This means 2 times the square root of 10. And that would be our simplified answer. This is the simplification of the square root of 40. We've written it as a part that we can do a square root of. And then what remains the square root of 10, there are no perfect squares that can divide into 10, nor is 10 a perfect square itself. So this would be our final answer. Let's take a look at part B. Again, 200 is not under standard times table, something that you might recognize. But hopefully we can all recognize that it is divisible by 100, which is a perfect square. We know that 200 we can write as 100 times 2. And again, this multiplication, the way that we're writing it, the reason why I'm choosing 100 here is because it's on that square list we just wrote down a moment ago. So you're looking for divisors of your numbers that are on list list here, your 4, 9, 16, 25, etc. Because we can write 200 as 100 times 2, properties of square roots say that I can take the square root of 100 and simply multiply that by the square root of 2. Now, the square root of 100, we know that's 10. And the square root of 2, that will not break down anymore. So our simplified answer on this is going to be 10 square roots of 2. Let me show you something else that might happen here. So maybe some students look at this list, and instead of noticing 100, maybe somebody notices, oh, I see that um, 4 can go into 200. So it is true that you can write 200 as 4 times 50. Properties of square roots say we can split this apart to do the square root of 4 times the square root of 50. The square root of 4 is 2. And then we still have our times the square root of 50. That is simplifying the square root of 200, but it doesn't go all the way. And the reason why it's not all the way simplified is because there's another perfect square that can go into 50, namely 25. So we're able to take 50 and write it as the square root of 25 times 2. Again, properties of radicals says we can split this apart and make it the square root of 5 times the square root of 2. Therefore, this is going to be 2 times the square root of 25. We know that that's 5 times the square root of 2. And then once you have some numbers that are outside of the radical together, those can be multiplied together to give us 10 square roots of 2. Notice that it's the exact same simplified answer. There's nothing more you can do with this. So this is entirely simplified. But notice that it took two steps here. And the reason why it took two steps is because we did not find the largest perfect square that can divide into 200. The largest perfect square that can divide into 200 is this number 100. And if you find the largest perfect square divisor, then you can do it in, in one step. Okay. So... My advice would be look for that largest perfect square divisor. It'll save you a lot of steps. But if you don't notice that or if you don't find it and you're at least able to reduce it a little bit, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure that whenever you're ready to write your final answer before you do so, make sure that whatever you have inside the radical isn't furtherly divi divisible by another perfect square. For example, there's no number in our list that 4, 9, 16, 25, etc., list that can divide into 2, yet when you look at 50, we know that it's divisible by 25, which is on that perfect square list, and that tells us that we can break that one down even more. Let's take a look at the next one. Here we have the square root of 26. 26 is not a perfect square nor is it divisible by a perfect square. So this one would already be simplified. There's nothing more we can do to this one. So the square 26 already is simplified. 
The product rule that we talked about can also be used to multiply two square roots. For example, here we're asked to simplify each radical. We have the square root of 6 times the square root of 2. Instead of splitting it apart, we can write these two together under one square root. 6 times 2 would give us, would give us 12. Notice that originally, neither one of these two would have been able to be simplified. Yet, nonetheless, once we're here, if we have the square root of 12, that can be reduced because 4 can go into 12 three times, and we know that the square root of 4 is just going to be 2. So our final answer on this one should be 2 square root of 3. Let's take a look at part B. We have the square root of 5 times the square root of 20. That should be equivalent to 5 times 20, which is 100, under the square root. But again, this can be simplified. The square root of 100 works out to be just 10, because 10 times 10 gives us 100. Let's look at the next one. We have the square root of 2 times the square root of 3 times the square root of 3. If we have that, that product of square roots, we can make it the square root of the products, where the multiplication takes place under the radical. 2 times 3 is 6. 6 times 3 is 18. So this gives us the square root of 18. Notice that the square root of 18 is divisible by the perfect square 9. 9 goes into 18 twice. So we can rewrite the square root of 18 as the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. And the square root of 9 is going to be 3. So our answer simplifies to 3 square roots of 2. We have what's referred to as the quotient rule for square roots next, which says that if you have the square root of a fraction, it's equal to the fraction of their square roots. So in essence, if you have a fraction that you're trying to do the square root of, you can simply take the square root of its numerator and divide it by the square root of its denominator. Let's take a look at example three. It says find each quotient. So here we have the square root of the numerator over the square root of the denominator. We can go ahead and um, write these all under one square root. This is the square root of the 27 over 3. We know 27 goes into 3 9 times. So this is the same thing as the square root of 9, which in turn is equal to 3. In part B, we have the square root of 60 divided by the square root of 5. This is equivalent to the square root of 60 over 5. 5 goes into 60 12 times. And then we've already seen this one broken down before. The square root of 12 we know is 4 times 3. And the square root of 4 is 2. So this one would reduce to 2 square roots of 3. The next thing we're going to come to is addition and subtraction of like radicals. And that says that if you have two square root terms, let's say a square root of c and b square root of c, if they have exactly the same radical part, meaning the square root terms are the same, then we can combine those expressions by adding the numbers that are in front and putting the square root at the end. So a square root of c plus b squared to c will give us a total of a plus b squared of c. And the same thing tr is true for subtraction. If you have like radicals, so same root, same radicand on the inside, if you have a squared of c and you're subtracting b squared of c, then in total that gives us a minus b squared of c. Let's go ahead and, and take a look at this example. For part four, we have six squared to three, plus eight squared to three, plus yet another five squared of three. Notice that these are all square root of three terms. 
So we're able to add the coefficients that are in front, 6 plus 8 plus 5, whatever that sums up to, that's how many square roots of 3 we're going to have. 6 plus 8 is 14. 14 plus 5 would give us 19. So final answer is 19 square root of 3. And again, it's implied that when we're writing this, what this really means is 19 times square root of 3. So there's we don't typically write it, but there's an implied multiplication in between those two terms. And if you think about it, this kind of makes sense, right? Whether you call this a square root of 3 or later on down the road when we get into the algebra section, we could even equally call this x. This, the mathematical structure works the same way, which is almost kind of like common sense um, if you think about it. Because whether you call the x a square root of 3 or a variable x or whether it represents something in the real world like a number of apples or a number of students, if you have 6 of something plus 8 of the same thing plus another 5 of the same thing, in total, what you're going to end up with is going to be 19 of those things, right? So very similarly in terms of structure, when we move to algebra, this problem could be written like 6x plus 8x plus 5x, and likewise, the answer would be 19x. Let's take a look at the next one. Here we're asked to find the difference. Once again, notice that we do have like radicals. We have 3 square roots of 10, and we're subtracting 7 square roots of 10. So to combine those, it's going to be 3 minus 7 square roots of 10. 3 minus 7, we know from the previous sections, is going to be negative 4 square roots of 10. And once you get some practice, I think everybody can just go right from here to here. You don't have to show this, this extra step. I'm just trying to highlight the, the rule that we just discussed a little bit ago. Let's take a look at example six. We are asked to perform the indicated operations. We have four square roots of 12 minus three square roots of eight, and then we're gonna add to it five square roots of 32. Here, even though we do see that there are a bunch of square roots, we are not able to, at this moment, go ahead and combine them because they have different radicands, so they're not like terms. This one is a square root of 12, this one is a square root of 8, and this one is a square root of 32. However, by looking at both the 12, 8, as well as the 32, those radicals can be reduced. Each one of those numbers is divisible by a perfect square. For example, 12, we can write as 4 times 3. So that we have 4 square roots of 12, where the square root of 12 can be broken apart into the square root of 4 times the square root of 3, minus the 8, it's also divisible by the perfect square of 4. 8 is 4 times 2. <coughs> and then lastly, the 16, it's going to be the 32, is divisible by the perfect square 16. And that goes in twice. These values, the divisors we're choosing, are such that these are perfect squares. So we should be able to figure out the value of each one of those. The square root of 4 is 2. So when I write that 2, that is now coming out from the radical because we've done that operation. And it's coming out as a multiplication. Similarly, we know the square root of 4 is 2. So we have a 2 coming out as a multiplication, and we know that the square root of 16 is 4. Once you have a value outside of the radical, once you've done the, the, the square root part, part, you can now multiply the outside values together. 4 times 2 is going to give us 8 square roots of 3 minus 6 square roots of 2, and then plus, this will be 20 square roots of 2. At this step, we've now simplified the radicals as much as we can, and we notice that we actually do have two like terms. Both of these terms have a square root of 2 with them, which means that those two can be combined. This one here, which has a square root of 3, is an entirely different square root, which means that it's an entirely different term 
So we cannot combine that one. If we have negative 6 square roots of 2, and we're adding to that positive 20 square roots of 2, that should give us a total of positive 14 square roots of 2, and that would be our final answer. So it's 8 square root of 3 plus 14 square root of 2. Another method that is sometimes used to simplify radical expressions is referred to as rationalizing the denominator. When a radical expression contains a square root sign in the denominator of the fraction, it is not technically considered to be in simplest terms. To be in simplest terms, we do not want to leave any square roots in the denominator of a fraction. It can be simplified by multiplying the numerator and denominator by a radical expression that will make the radicand in the denominator a perfect square, and this is called rationalizing the denominator. We've already seen from before, like when we were getting common denominators, that for example, I can take the fraction 3 fourths, and I can make it an equivalent fraction with a denominator of 20 by simply multiplying top and bottom by 5. Right? 4 times 5 will give us 20 in the bottom, and 3 times 5 will give us 15 in the numerator. The benefit to this is the fraction 3 fourths is equivalent to 15 twentieths because all we did was multiply top and bottom by the same thing. If that happens to be a square root, for example, if we have 2 over the square root of 3, this is not going to be simplified because right now we're left with a square root in the bottom. So our goal is to do the same thing. We want to multiply top and bottom by some quantity that will leave us with a perfect square in the denominator. To do this, you ask yourself the question, well, what perfect square, what is the smallest perfect square that can 3 divide into? And the answer is that 3 can divide into, into 9. So we want to multiply the square root of 3 by something that will give us the square root of 9. And that is simply going to be the square root of 3 itself. Whatever we multiply to the bottom, we also have to multiply to the top. In the denominator, square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is the square root of 9. In the numerator, 2 times the square root of 3 gives us 2 square root of 3. And now this will simplify because in the denominator, we know that the square root of 9 is just going to give us 3. So starting with 2 square roots of 3, it is not simplified because we have a radical on the bottom. Multiplying both top and bottom by square root of 3 over square root of 3 that process is called rationalizing the denominator. And what that results in is this expression, 2 square root of 3 over 3, which is considered to be in simplest terms because there is no square root anymore in the denominator. So I might have stolen the thunder on the first one a little bit, but notice that 18 over the square root of 3, it's not simplified. We do have a square root in the denominator. So our goal is to multiply top and bottom by something that will give us a perfect, a perfect square in the denominator. The smallest perfect square that 3 can divide into is going to be 9. And to get 9, we would need to do 3 times 3. So I'm going to put a square root of 3 on the top, and I'm going to put a square root of 3 on the bottom. In the numerator, we are going to, we're going to get 18 times the square root of 3 which would give us 18 square root of 3. And in the denominator, we have the square root of 9. We know that the square root of 9 is equal to 3. So that rationalizes it. But now we can simplify it even more. Notice that we have two numbers in our fraction that are outside of the root. And both of these are divisible by 3. 3 goes into itself once. 3 goes into 18 6 times. So we can write our final answer as 6 square root of 3 over 1. But if anything's over 1, you don't really have to write the, the division by 1. That's just going to be 6 square root of 3. Let's take a look at the next example. We have 6 divided by the square root of 18. We need to multiply 18 by something that will give us a perfect square. So we go through our square root list. The numbers like 4, 9, 
16, 25, etc. And we look, what is the smallest number, perfect square number that's divisible by 18? And the answer is 36. To get to 36, we would need to multiply the square root of 18 by the square root of 2. Therefore, we also have to do that to our numerator. 6 times the square root of 2 would give us 6 square root of 2. This is equal to 6 square root of 2, all divided by the square root of 36, which we know is the same thing as 6. And then from there, notice that we have a common factor of 6 in both top and bottom, which we can reduce, which will give us the square root of 2 over 1, which is going to be the square root of 2. So in part B, that should reduce to the square root of 2. And this is what we're looking for. Not only do we not have a fraction, which doesn't always happen, but more importantly, what we want to have here is we want to make sure that we don't have any square roots in our denominator, and that is true. Let's take a look at example 8. We are asked to simplify the square root of 5 over, this, over 6. So 5 sixths is not a perfect square, but what we can do with this one is we can rewrite this. Remember, if you have the square root of a fraction, that's the same thing as the square root of the numerator over the square root of the denominator. When we use that rule for radicals, the way that it's written right now, it does indeed have a square root in the denominator. So we want to get rid of that. So we want to ask ourselves the question, what do I need to multiply 6 by in order to get a perfect square? And the answer is the smallest perfect square would be 36. That's the smallest perfect square that 6 can divide into. So we're going to multiply top and bottom by the square root of 6. In the numerator, the square root of 5 times the square root of 6 would give us the square root of 30. In the denominator, 6 times 6 is 36, so that's going to be in a square root. The square root of 30 will not break down. It's not a perfect square, nor is it divisible by a perfect square. But in the denominator, the square root of 36 we know is simply 6. And that would be our, our final answer. Okay. Be very careful. We cannot simplify this anymore. Even though, as numbers, 30 and 6 both have a common factor, one of those numbers is in a square root and the other one is not. So we can't do anything more there. The only way you can ever simplify within a fraction is if both of the numbers you're looking at are both either inside of a square root or if both of the numbers you're looking at are both outside of a square root. If you have a number inside and a number outside, then you can't do anything with those. It's kind of like an apples and oranges. Those ones do not mix. One of the other skills that we want to have is we want to use our calculator to approximate each rational number to three places. So some of you, your input might be different depending upon the type of calculator you have. But for the first one, if I'm using a TI calculator, the square root symbol, it's above the X squared key in blue. So to access it, I first have to hit the second blue key. Then I hit my squared button. That brings up the square root. The square root of 311, notice that it's going to go on forever. If we round it to three decimal places, this would round to 17.635. And again, that's just an approximation. It's not an exact answer because it really goes on forever. Similarly, if I wanted the square root of 41, I would hit second, square root, 41, hit enter, and we should be getting 6.403 for that. So the square root of 41 is approximately 6.403.